What I'm going to talk about is some of the uh, work being done, uh, some of the research being done by the robust distributed systems. I almost want to call us the consortium. So we really are. These uh, are projects that are led by me and uh, Dr. Longfrey and Virgilio Gonzalez. Virgilio, you here? Actually, probably most nobody here knows you because you're. Your you, electrical and computer engineering faculty you should stand up so they know who you are. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and we're all looking at problems that are related to the autonomic, reliable, uh, the autonomic, reliable, and secure distributed systems. I don't know if you've heard the word autonomic before, but the point here is that, like the human body describes autonomic, if you rip your skin it heals. It's not, it's not that you forever have a rip and you start leaking and you stop working properly and you get infected. No. Your body has, has mechanisms to protect you against the harm from the rip and then to start healing. And the point here is we want to build systems that will continue to function well even when components fail or components misbehave. Particularly these are distributed systems, multiple, multiple computers attached on a network. And ideally will actually provide better service as more machines are available because you have the ability to push more services off to those who are working. And we're also very concerned with security issues such as confidentiality, integrity. If you, pick, if you have someone who's another system that's, that's helping out, you'd like to know that they're delivering reliable data. Irrefutability. You know, if someone tells a lie, you want to be able to catch them shouldn't be able to refute they told that lie. Um, one area we're working in is something called structured peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, the point here is to solve, this, it's essentially the Napster problem. You know, with Napster or, or Kazal, these file sharing systems, the objective is to get data from somebody who has a copy. And the great challenge is knowing who has a copy. Uh, Napster took the solution of having one, one server, which of course everyone counted on, and when that was taken out of service, the service failed. There are also uh, solutions where you exhaustively, I ask everyone I know, ask everyone they know, and of course you, you, you could just tie up everyone looking for something that nobody knows, and it's not terribly direct. And there's some techniques that extend the, uh, the basic concepts behind hash tables onto a large distributed network in a way where we're finding out, some, uh, finding out who has a copy of something only takes a logarithmic number of computations. For example, if there are 2 to the 20, that's a million participants, you only have to talk to 20 others. Um, the challenge in these systems relates to something called churn. Now, let's imagine we built our indexing infrastructure, and one of the participating machines is Brian's laptop, and he folds it off to, goes off the network. That's machines enter and leave unexpectedly. The system should be resilient to that. For that matter, if I want a copy of something, I'd like to find out, or I'm looking for someone who provides a service, I want to find somebody who's near me on the network. And I'm blocking by, by locality. Um, if there are millions or billions of participants, I can't know the state of the whole system. No, no participant can really know the state of the whole system. You only know something. You only know, the question is how much information do you need to share in order to maintain, uh, in order to provide high quality services. And finally, you've got these malicious participants. You know, this is where someone, uh, instead of running the official program to participate, well, they've got a broken one that's designed to confuse the system. And you'd like to build systems that are resistant to that. Uh, of course, the benefits are fault tolerance and performance that gets better as you add more participants. Uh, one project that's being uh, our effort that's directly going towards this is something called local DHT. DHT is distributed hash table. That's this family of algorithms that allows you to do indexing efficiently on a large network. And large, typically these algorithms are optimized to provide good performance when nobody's well connected. But frankly, if you have two, two machines that are, we've got a bunch of machines in the same laboratory, they're, they're not going to have ter the lookups in there aren't terribly fast. And we like to, we're, the objective here is to have a system which will find extremely fast lookup 
if somebody on the local network has it, or let's say within the university has it, and also will have the good have reasonably good performance, they have to look at have to look it up uh, globally among all the participants, let's say on the planet or on, on the network. They make could go outside the planet, right? Um, you also have Sloth, which uh, which is a high performance network file system, and Fern, both of, uh, which is a uh, authorization system, which I'll talk about on subsequent slides. Uh, so the idea with FERN essentially is the authorization system for, or potential authorization system for a large distributed system. Because uh, I think we've got millions or billions of systems that are all cooperating. And so at any point, I may need to talk to anybody or any machine may need to talk to any other. How do you know if they're authorized? And the, just the tr if there was somebody who, could t who knew who's authorized, who's trusted, who's not trusted, hey, he lied, i got to tell somebody, tell the guy in charge so he can blacklist him. Just the traffic, the management of who's presently authorized is a very hard problem. And we have a, a, a scalable solution to that where, um, wh where the amount of network traffic to maintain your list, that there are a bunch of folk you're communicating with, maintain, to watch over where they still should be trusted, it is, re is very small. It's actually uh, a, it's, we're using a data structure, it's actually essentially a tree. You look them up in the tree, but the whole path in the tree is, is authenticated using cryptographic techniques. And this tree has a, is cacheable, because it's doing by cacheable. If I need to walk that tree, and I need a, a vertex on that tree, I don't want to have to look very far for it. Be good if somebody near me already had it, if I could get it from them. Remember, if we have, so, so if we solve that Napster problem, who has what? I could ask someone near me for that node. Now imagine if we had a tree rotation. Remember from data structures, if your tree could become unbalanced, you might have to rotate the tree and everyone's, everyone's position changes. We have, we have a self-balancing tree. It's actually a part of the project that uh, Dr. Longpe worked on. It was the analysis of our tree where we're able to keep it balanced without ever needing to rotate it. Uh, and so, as I said, uh, the long frame I've been working on it. Also, uh, Arthur Walton, who's an undergraduate, is working on the second implementation of it. And the first implementation was uh, constructed construct, uh, in collaboration with uh, Steve Gutstein, Brian Spring, and David Herrera. We also have, a, this is our high performance network file system. This, this, is a, this, this is a problem that we didn't expect to be attacking. Just sort of popped out. When we had, remember we said that laboratory at the end of the hallway for teaching network, cl network classes, courses in networking and courses in, in architecture, what we teach in there? And we, we, we had this idea that we could have this very innovative network lab. And we got all these computers, and then we realized, oh my God. You have to manage 30 computers, and that's, that, that's a maintenance nightmare. And I remembered wistfully back when I was a grad student, it was common to have diskless workstations. This was because disks were really expensive at that moment. And the idea was that your workstation didn't have a disk, it just would access storage on a file server someplace else. It would boot off that, that remote machine, and your machine, your, your machine would just you, it would execute locally, but any time it had need to access the file system, it would just communicate over the network. Now, these systems had horrible performance because back then networks were slow. Uh, the central server was much, much slower than we could buy cheaply today. Uh, and basically, the moment the disk got cheap, every machine got a disk. But let's go back to what was maintenance like back then. You, every machine, like the, most of the machines in the department where I was going to school ha were exactly the same. They all booted off the network, and the network administrators, or the system administrators, maintain one installation. And all the machines just boot up, they pick up a copy of the operating system, a copy of all the applications, and let's say there was a need to upgrade, or nowadays we didn't have viruses back then, or infections, but imagine if that installation got corrupted. All you'd have to do was reinstall the master server, Tell everybody, go turn your computer off, turn it back on, and you got the whole new install. What's our situation now? Every machine has a separate install. 
And if, and, if, and if there's an infection of our installation, you know, Leo and, his, and the crew who work with them will be up all night reinstalling on every machine here. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have that nice model where, where they're just picking up remotely without the performance penalty? And what happened in the meantime is that networks got really fast. The cheap networks that we have connecting our machines nowadays, gigabit networks, are comparably fast to disks. Faster for many disk operations than the network, which means that if my computer needs something off the disk, which, you know, we're not we're set up disk locally, have it on the server, but heck, it, the computer next to me has a copy. Let's just pick it up from them. And the idea here is we, what's called a distributed disk cache or, or buffer cache for the, for the data that's in the file system. And uh, we're going to use uh, local VHT to see what the copy of whatever data block we need. And um, of course, we want this thing to be reliable. You know, if you plug your laptop into our network and we don't trust you, probably don't take your data. Because otherwise, you could corrupt all the machines on our network. Notice we got firm. And the real challenge is here is now we've got this, you know, rooms of computers that could run faster without having local disks. We have all the advantages of the maintenance of only one system. They all boot off the remote system. Of course, the one, serv the one server gets installed, the machine comes up, first client comes up, he, install he gets himself going, and that machine comes up and get data from him. Now they're both serving everyone else. Looks sort of like swarms. And um, the real challenge, the interesting challenges come come up when a machine doesn't need the data that it has its memory anymore, but it's valuable to others. How are we going to figure out what, when we, whether, I, whether my throwing away this data rather than keeping it is bad for the community, sufficiently bad for the community, I should keep it or maybe give it to somebody else. And this is a project that, uh, that Ryan Spring, who's over there, is working on. And now we're getting to the projects that for Helio Gonzalez, why don't you come up? They deserve to see, to, to see you, and they, they know well. Actually, some of you, I took classes with you. Some yeah, of you took the digital design yeah. a long time ago with me. Mm -hmm. So, in any case, his, his primary interest is in communication. I'm interested in, in communication and security. And we both have efforts in having to do with privacy of medical communication. Some of the technologies that uh, we are seeing nowadays are embedded controllers, embedded uh, microcomputers. And some of the issues with, with them is uh, they want to communicate, and, but we need to protect them for uh, unauthorized entries. And at the same time, uh, they need to be reliable. So there are efforts in that regard. Uh, for example, the chips that can be embedded into products, uh, they are called RFIDs or radio frequency IDs. We should carry some up with us. <laughs> the thing is that you, in a book or in a product that you buy at the store, they have those chips embedded. And uh, when they come through the door, uh, they can be read. But what happens if they go out of the store? Someone that is nearby, they can uh, start uh, looking at, oh, this is a customer from the competition has buy uh, these products. So you don't want that to happen with your competition. So uh, you need to disable those uh, chips to be read. And if you start using devices for medical applications, and you also want to protect them, so no one will enter and tamper with those devices, or uh, for insurance purpose, you don't want someone else to know what you do you have. And for example, if you have a pacemaker, the new pacemakers um, take recordings of how, you, how your health is. Last thing you want when you go for a job interview is for the job interviewer to be able to detect that you have a pacemaker. So, well, actually, a, a paper that, that Ryan and I had at one of the recent uh, med medical-related technology conferences was uh, on techniques for increasing the security of these things, because the present protocols, the device will refuse to have a coherent conversation with, with a reader, but meanwhile, it'll have an incoherent conversation, which means it's there. So we need to have protocols whereby 
The doctor, or for that matter, you know, maybe your PDA could talk to your pacemaker and transmit it back. Uh, but meanwhile, someone who has no authority can't talk to it, but the other hand, if you pass it on the street, the EMS worker can read it in a way that if they were to improperly use their device, they could get in trouble for it, have an audit trail. So those are all so those are security protocols that are overlaid in there. And I've, actually, this is a case where uh, uh, Dr. Longfrey is working with us. The other family of uh, projects that we are working <coughs> is related to small devices uh, that are networked. Uh, common uh, applications are wireless sensor networks. You have a bunch of microcontrollers uh, the size of just a AA battery pack or maybe the, a wooden size. They are scattering uh, in the field or you have uh, devices in, at every room or every desk. <coughs> Sorry. Every desk might have a device and the thing is that they are collecting data. Eventually, that data has to be sent to a collection center where you can process it. So there are several challenges here, uh, such as how to send information properly to the destination. Some cases, you have fixed devices. They don't need to move, so the problem is simplified. But what about, uh, imagine that every one of you in your cell phone has a collecting device. So your cell phone becomes a sensor, and then you want to extrapolate that information and bring it back to the collection center. In that case, uh, for example, uh, for medical applications, we are exploring an, uh, a situation where uh, different devices are collecting data from the patients, and then at the, uh, the nurses where they are moving through uh, with every patient, the, the device that they are wearing is collecting data, and eventually, when they return back to the nurse station, that information is downloaded into the server, so now the medical record is updated with that information. The only problem with that is that the information might grow exponentially because many nurses might be working around and each one is collecting copies and new copies of the same data. So eventually that data has to be identified to be a duplicate and has to be destroyed. Yeah, so this, we're actually presently looking at something called an anti-entropy protocol where those who, uh, where once data is uploaded, a receipt is propagated through the system. Just like if I have information, my radio gets in, into range of Virgilio's, my information gets shared with him because they gossip. If I've uploaded some range of data, that's also gossiped, and he knows it's been uploaded, he can delete it from his memory, and then, you know, when he walks past Pat, Dr. T Dr. Teller's mach you know, machine, it, no it, it, it we also infected it with knowledge that this data's been uploaded. And the next upload receipt will be for a wider range than the previous one. And when those receipts meet, only, only the one which, you know, when the machine sees there's an upload of everything by 2 p.m. this afternoon, the one everything by 4 p.m., we'll start off the one from 2 p.m. And so that, that approach is called anti-entropy, and that way we can keep the storage required for the system limited. Um, there's also a very interesting case of what happens if you're, sometimes you can communicate Link to link. You all, if, let's say you guys are sharing data. Well, maybe all your radios can talk to each other. You don't know. You can actually route to each other directly. But maybe there's somebody here walking to the other room who's going to carry information that's get moved over there. So there's an interesting interface between places where the radios are close enough together to communicate versus where some of the radios are disconnected and the person who is in the person who travels from one place to another. Or maybe, the, or maybe the seeing eye dog, the helper animal, is carrying the radio to transport the data. Sneaker net. All automatic. By the way, we look, this, both of these are relevant for the cyber infrastructure project you heard about before, and we're working with, the, with Craig Tweedy, environmental science, because he has that train which collects information, and it passes sensors, and it's going to pick up the data, and bring it back to the tower for up, you know, to a communications tower for upload, and, uh, and and some of the sensors will be close enough they'll just send this route by if I got a, if I can reach Christian's sensor hit his radio he can reach uh, somebody in the middle of the room it could hop its way through if you're dense enough the point is the system should on its own uh, determine what's reachable directly and what requires going through extra, going through a with going through uh, in a, a mobile unit. One of the, the other projects, the <coughs> case of routing, uh, 
I have a student, Dante Barragan is working also with uh, Vladik uh, in the problem of how to identify the most uh, efficient route. Remember that these uh, small devices are battery powered and uh, one of the things that you want is to preserve the batteries so they will last longer, otherwise uh, they will die in a few hours, in a few days. You don't want that. So we are looking into that approach. And this is actually one of the projects where an undergraduate student or somebody can help because a lot of algorithms and if somebody can program that... Actually, Brian's likely to be jumping in there soon. If others are interested in working on this, if you've taken Architecture 1, you know enough to start helping us program up these devices. The little embedded controllers, just like the robot controllers. It's a really fun place to work. Or you can work even if you didn't take Architecture That's true. You're not going to program, you can work on simulations. <laughs> yeah, there are lots of interesting problems that come up. Or for that matter, come by, visit the group, and um, the group meets uh, 8.30. It, we were scheduled, for, we we're presently scheduled for 8.30 in the morning on Fridays, we're looking for another time. So if you <laughs> want to work with us, you <laughs> want to let uh, Dr. Longpray or Dr. Gonzalez or me, no. Um, but this, but this, this is a really fun family of projects. Also, by the way, that foveal image sensor we talked about, at the, at the first, at the, you remember we built, we have the sensor where we can, where it's, where we can zoom in. I should have, I should have had a slide in here on that. Um, it's also within our family of projects, it's a collaboration also with electrical engineering. We're designing a new sensor for that. There's an electrical engineering senior project, actually two senior project teams working with us to design that. And that could also make its way into the cyber infrastructure uh, project because after all, Taking a view of the whole of the whole of a large scene in the Arctic. Well, you really are looking for specific things, and that's the only stuff you want to transmit. You don't want to waste energy or bandwidth in transmitting information about what hasn't changed or what's not an object of interest. If you're looking, if you're interested in polar bears, you want to recognize the polar bear and transmit that polar bear. So. Um, that's all we have to uh, talk about today about our pro about our family of projects. If you're interested in uh, joining with us, let us know.